Well, good morning, Pleasant Green. Hello, hello, hello. How do you do? At Pleasant Green Baptist Church, we're delighted to see you. We're exalting Christ, embracing community, and engaging culture. Hello, hello, hello from Pleasant Green. What a wonderful day it is to be uh, present with you all today in Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and on our call-in line. It is spring again, and yes, uh, brothers and sisters, how grateful and uh, we are to God for bringing us from one season to the next season. Last week, we had several storms uh, uh, come through our, uh, our communities, and the weeks before that, we've been dealing with water crises and even ice storms and all kinds of things. How great it is that God is still keeping us in the middle of all of the storms that we have come through. And yes, spring is upon us. And thank God for uh, his giving us this moment in time. We ought to just go ahead and shout and praise him right now because he is worthy to be praised. We have a blessed assurance from him that he is ours and we are his. And as we get ready to engage in our worship, uh, Marcus is going to come and he's going to play for us as we worship God in spirit and in truth, for he is seeking such to worship him. Hello, hello, hello. How do you do? At Pleasant Green Baptist Church, we're so glad to see you. We're exalting Christ, embracing community and engaging culture. Hello, hello, hello from Pleasant Green. Good morning, Pleasant Green Baptist Church. Today I'll be playing Blessed Assurance and Holy, Holy, Holy.
and I hope you enjoyed this segment. Please remember to get the Pleasant Rain Baptist Church. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Oh, brothers and sisters, thank God for this morning. Thank all of you all for being with us all again on this day. I want to invite your attention to 2 Kings 22, verses 14 through 20. In this text is where we'll find our uh, message for the morning, beginning at verse 14. So the priest Hilkiah, Aiakam, Akbar, Shaphar, and Aziah went to the prophetess Huldah, wife of Shalom, son of Tekiah son of Harah, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the second district. They spoke there with her. She said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Say to the man who sent you to me, I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants, fulfilling all the words of the book that the king of Judah has read because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all of the work of their hands. My wrath will indeed be kindled against this place. It will not be quenched, but to the King of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. As for the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what was spoken against this place and against its inhabitants, against its people, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. I have heard you. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your ancestors. And you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster that I'm bringing on this place. This they reported to the king. Brothers and sisters, this is an impactful passage. And I know it sounds uh, gloom and doom and everything is there. And it does not provide much inspiration or much uh, uh, adulation and, and much excitement and all of that, something you can run and shout it. But this is a prophetic passage uh, that is practical in our life. And remember, in this series, we're asking the question, is the prophetic still practical? And this prophetic proclamation here that is given in this text came again in a time of needed social change and the need of, in the time of societal chaos, in the time of statewide corruption, that needed sovereign correction. Both the people and those in power were involved in all of these issues and they needed to get back to the confirming and conforming standards of the covenant that had been given by God. God had called people who loved him and loved his people to be sounding boards and sounding the alarms to all of those, uh, to the people and to those in the power to the public and the private spaces and places. And so here, what we learn and what we glean from what God has to say to us today, as we are seeking the prophetic voice that we are called to follow uh, in this passage, as opposed to our own pride and our own prejudices, perspectives and politics, we have seen in our time, we have seen that in our day, we are oftentimes haughty, high-minded, hasty, and wrong-headed in our, in our doings and in our things. And we have not yet come to a place where we've humbled ourselves before God when his word has been heard among us. Even in, it doesn't matter what circle of life or situation you find yourself in, we find ourselves on the side of high-mindedness and rather humility. But God wants us to know this morning, this day, brothers and sisters, that just as he has spoken to the prophets, he speaks to the people. He has called the prophetic voice to be heard and to be heeded. If we will not humble ourselves, and if indeed we are going to humble ourselves, we, as well as our leaders in our community, in our city, and in our country, we must understand that we are going to have to focus on the book. 
That's the message for today. Focus on the book. Whenever life gets bad, whenever life looks down, whenever things are not going your way, whenever there's a situation in your life, whenever there's a circumstance that you can't quite understand, whenever you've come stumbled upon something that, that pricks you at your heart, you and I and our leaders in our communities and our countries always must focus on the book. It is the book that gives us life. It is the book that tells us what to do. It is the book that makes it easy for us to understand how we are to live our life. It's the B-I-B-L-E. Yeah, that's the book for me. I stand upon the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And one preacher once upon a time said, the Bible is the basic instructions before leaving earth. And what you heard in that passage what a was a prophetic sounding voice speaking about what the contents of that book were and what was discovered and what had been happened upon. And if in as we are, as we engage in this story in Second Kings chapter twenty two, we will discover that a focus on the book will assist us in every part of our life. The point number one of the message is focusing on the book brings consultation. And we find that in the very first verse that we had uh, read in uh, 2 Kings 22, uh, verse 14. And before I get into that verse, let me kind of set the stage for you of where we are and how we have gotten here. Young King Josiah, who was eight years old when he had come to the uh, uh, kingship of, of, of Judah, this young boy of eight years old, whose grandfather was one of the worst kings in all of Israel. He had come into a time, into a place when Israel's corruption, Israel's, uh, Israel's outlook on the life was in such a disarray where the country was in shambles and chaos and divided about everything and anything. There was no, there was nothing positive happening in and around the country. And this little young boy at eight years old comes under the tutelages of prophets and preachers and priests and all of the persons who would groom him and grow him. And here in this passage, they have, uh, they have been uh, in Second Kings, when we get to Second Kings 22, as this young boy is being groomed into his kingship, they, they discover, uh, Helkai discovers a book of the law and they open that book and they read it and they're troubled by what they see. They're troubled by what they hear from the word in the book and they don't know what to do. And now this young king He's about eight. Uh, he's about 25, 26 years old. It's about 18 years later into his into his kingship. They're hearing the words in this book that are talking about all of the destruction, all of the devastation, all of the things that are going to come upon Israel and make them a desolation. And they do not yet know what to do. And so the young king says, look, we need to hear from the Lord. We see what's in the book. We, we've heard what you, the book has said. We need to go to and consult the Lord and hear what the Lord has to say. So I need you all to go find somebody to talk to and, and see what has come along. And as we get into verse 14, he says, go find somebody. He has called together Hilkiah, the priest. He had called together Ahiakim who was a friend of Jeremiah, one of the major prophets of this time period and of this day. He had called together Akbor, who was an uh, influential influencer in the community and in the uh, courts uh, of, of Israel. He had called together Shaphan, who was one of the scribes. He was one of the lawyers and one of the lawgivers and law keepers and Asahiah who was the king's servant. He had called all of these people together to consult with about what they had found in this book and the words that they had read in this book. And they were so puzzled and perplexed about what the things they heard and what they saw and what they read in the book that Josiah says, okay, look, we've come together. We've consulted together. We've counseled together. We've talked together about the things that are in this book. So I need you to go and speak to someone who can get in touch with the, with the Lord, who can get in tune with what the Lord is saying to us in these words that we have just read. And so they, saw, so they sought out Huldah, who was a prophetess, 
in the second district, which meant she was just a short distance away from the main kingdom, from the main castle, from the seat of government. She was just a little ways away. There were people that she they could have gone to. She was the but she was right there in the community, in the city. And sometimes brothers and sisters, we don't need to go all the way to the White House or all the way to the Capitol to find somebody who can tell us what we need to do to handle our situations and our circumstances. Sometimes the people in the White House need to just send somebody down next door, somebody who's right there around from us, who we can get to who knows the word of God, who knows the will of God, who has seen the working of God and who has the heart of God within them and the word down deep in them. And we can get to them. And this is who this holder woman was. This is who this prophetess they said for. They went to hold a prophetess. And she was the wife of Shalom, who was the son of Tekiah, the son of Hahas, the keeper of the royal wardrobe. He was a intricately connected to the king. Uh, so this woman holder who had been married to the grandson of a woman, of a man who was a keeper of the royal wardrobe, she knew what had been going on in Jerusalem. She knew what had been happening in Israel. She knew all of the things that had been going around, all of the corruption and all of the chaos and all of the confusion that had been going around and they went to her to see, now what does the Lord have to say about all of this stuff that we have found in the book? And the reason we know that she knew everything that was going on, the text tells us that she lived in the college, in the place of instruction, in the second district, in the new quarter, in the new, in the short place away from the castle. So she was intimately involved with instructing the children of Israel about what was going on in the country and in the community. But she was also close enough to the king's courts that she knew politically and perspectively all of the things that had been happening and she could give a good perspective because she gave the perspective from the Lord as well as the perspective from the land and the people. So this prophetess, prophetess is with whom that they consulted here in verse 14. And so brothers and sisters, when you focus on the book, you can gain consultation because counsel will help explain the reality that we are dealing with in our time. And the reality was that Jerusalem was in trouble. Israel was in trouble. Judah was in trouble. America is in trouble. Mississippi is in trouble. Jackson and Vicksburg is in trouble. And we need godly counsel to explain to us the reality of the situation that's going on in our land today. And we need some we need some good godly counsel to explain the reality of the content of our situation, of the things that are written about us in the book. Yeah, brothers and sisters, we need counsel to explain the reality of the content of what's going on. Judah, uh, the, the Hilkiah had discovered this book and he had taken it to Josiah and to Shaphan and to all of the persons and they had gathered there to hear the words. And when Josiah heard the book, he knew he heard the content. He heard what was said in the words, but he needed an explanation as to what this content meant for uh, this country in this time, in this space, because these things had been written years before. Oh, brothers and sisters here in our community and in our cities and in our capital city of the state of Mississippi, we know what has been going on and it has been going on for a lot of years. It has not just been happening. It has not just started. It has not just taken place. We know the content. And so when we come together under good godly counsel to see the reality of the content of what's going on in the book, in the con in the text of what we of our life, what the book has already said is what has already been written about us. But Joseph Josiah needed to know more than just what the content was. He needed to know why the context was now. He needed to know the context of the reality of their situation. Why are these things happening now? Why did Hilkiah find the book under my leadership? Why did this happen? 
under my reign? Why did this happen for such a time as this? What does it mean for Israel? What does it mean for America that we have a president following after another president? What does it mean to have a president in the middle of a pandemic that behaves one day, one way and then you get another president in the middle of the same pandemic that responds a totally different way? Why is this happening right now? And Brothers and sisters, sometimes a change in administration means a change in, in how things are going to be administered in the country. And Josiah, who was a good little boy at eight years old, and the Bible says his whole heart was after God. He did everything right in the sight of God, but he still needed that counsel to explain the reality of the content and the context of the situation now he finds himself in 18 years later. Brothers and sisters, we have found ourselves in the content and context of situations and circumstances that have now been taking place years over year over year over year. And now we're having to deal with the realities of what's going on in our communities and in our uh, cities and in our country. The reality is that we have been behaving in such a way that God has not been honored by in the public square in the in the in, or in the private citizenry in the in our private spaces and places. God has not been honored, and now He's showing up, telling us that correction is needed. And so, second point of the message is not only is focusing on the book brings us consultation in terms of the reality of the content and the context of our situation, but focusing on the book brings brings us to a place of confrontation in terms of how we're going to respond in the situation that we are in. Look at verses 15, 16, and 17 with me, if you will. Let's look at them. The, the prophetess Huldah said to the men who had come to her to seek out an answer to the question of why is this stuff uh, written in the book, the content and the context. And she said to them, look, this is what the Lord has already said. The God of Israel said, go back and tell the man who sent you to me that I am bringing disaster on this place. I am bringing destruction on this place. I am bringing desolation to this place and to its people. All of the words of the book of the law, which the king of, the, of Judah has now read, which Josiah has heard, which Josiah has been pricked by, you and I'm going to bring all of this to bear upon you. And then why am I going to bring all of this to bear upon you? Because you have forsaken me. You have, and how have you forsaken me? You have burned incense to other gods. You have provoked me to anger with your handmade, made up idols that you have put before me. You have done so much stuff in, in disregard to me. You have done so much to corrupt your heart against me. You have caused so much wickedness, chaos and confusion and calamity in this community, in this covenant congregational community that I have created and established. And now my hands are against you. And, and some brothers and sisters, you've heard it said before, and sometimes you need to hear it said again, that occasionally God has to oppose you in order to bless you. In order for you to get yourself right and get yourself situated, God has to come down on you and say some stuff to you that's going to hurt you and feel like it's harming you, but it's, for, it's all really to help you. Yeah, I'm thinking about well, what we've been seeing in our social media and posts and our, and, our, and our daily news all over the place, how Kirk Franklin, this guy who sings all of these songs, came down upon his 30-something-year-old son who was behaving badly, and all of a sudden, Kirk Franklin decided to get on social media and apologize for coming down on that boy and saying some stuff and using some choice words against him. And now he might not should have chosen those particular words, but sometimes... Sometimes the person in authority has to come down on those who are under their authority to help them understand that, listen, you have wronged me too many times and in too many ways, and I've got to handle you. I've got to deal with you. And when I, then the way I'm going to deal with you, brother, you is not going to like it. 
And so this is what Huldah says that God is saying to the children of Israel, because she says in verse 17, therefore my wrath is burning against this place and it shall not be quenched. It is not going anywhere. It is not going to go down. I am upset with you. I am angry with you. I am bothered by what you have done. I'm burning hot against you. Uh, look, I'm, I'm about to beat you to death. Boy, I will beat you down. Don't you know who you talking to? Don't you know who you messing with? And that's kind of like what Kirk Franklin said to his 30 something year old boy. And here these children of Israel are, have been behaving badly all this time. And so they've been now confronted to elicit a response uh, on their behalf. And this confrontation elicits a response because of the corruption that Israel had undergone. Don't you see the corruption that they have done, that they have uh, engaged in, that they have forsaken how uh, God, God said, listen, your, your corruption needs to elicit some kind of response and I need to confront you with every fiber of the wrath that I have. He says, well, well what corruption are you? You've forsaken me. You've turned your back on me. You've gone away after other gods. You've done this to me. I've given you everything that you needed to make it in this world. I've given you everything to benefit you and to help you build a life and to help you become better. And you have turned away from me and forsaken me. And on top of all of that, on top of turning away from me, you've decided that you're going to burn incense to other gods who I have stamped out before you, who I have protected you again, who I have defeated the kings and and allowed you to live into a promised land. And now you're going to have the audacity to turn around and bow down to them and burn incense to them after I have fed you in the wilderness, after I have given you manna from heaven, after I have given you houses that you did not build, after I have provided for you, after I have protected you, after I have put my name upon you, after I have called you after my own name, you're going to regard, you're going to return to favor to me by burning incense and giving credit to somebody else? How dare you? That's the kind of corruption that Israel had undergone. And brothers and sisters, I'm afraid and I am scared to look at the world of our country and how we have done the same thing. God has given us so much, but we have turned our back on him. God has provided us for so much, but yet we have decided to uh, contribute the credit to somebody else. And he says, watch, you have provoked me to anger with your handmade, made up idol. You have bowed down to somebody else other than me. And you believe somehow that I'm still supposed to bless you? Oh, brothers and sisters, God says, my wrath is kindled against that kind of stuff. And so God confronts Israel to elicit a response from them because of their corruption. How, but brothers and sisters, I need to let you know that God is confronting us in the same way because we have forsaken God. We have turned our back on God. We have bowed down to other gods. We have burned in sin. And I hear you saying, no, 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 no. I love Jesus. Oh, but you won't do anything he tells you. You won't focus on what the book told you to do. You won't do what he said do. You won't live your life the way he said live. You try to cheat a little bit over him, get a little bit over there, do a little bit of dirt over him, follow after your own uh, feelings and after your own facts over there, not following after faith over here. God says you have wholeheartedly turned your backs on me. You have forsaken me in every particular regard of your life. And so God confronts Israel to elicit a response based on their own corruption, but he confronts them to elicit a response because he needs to offer them correction. Yes, brothers and sisters, God says, I, though you have forsaken me, I have not forsaken you. Though you have burned in sense against me, I have not I have not burned you up in the way that I could. Though you have provoked me, I have pardoned you on many an occasion. And how many of you all ought to be shouting and happy, glad and shouting hallelujah all over the place right now that when you forsook God, he forgave you. That when you, when you uh, 
turned your back on God and ran after your own way. He did not turn his back on you. He stood there with open arms wide waiting for you to turn around and come back to him. And when you provoked him to anger, he was still right there ready to pardon you in the midst of all of your sin and did not treat you as you deserve. Oh, hallelujah to the lamb today. I am inspired and thanking God today that he did not treat me as my sins deserve. And so he elicits, uh, he confront, but he confronts us to elicit a response in our corruption for our correction. God needed to show Israel that his response to their corruption uh, and his correction for the choices that they had made individually and collectively, intentionally and insultingly against his word and against his book, against his program, against what he had already commanded them. And the same thing applies to us in our congregations and in our community today. God is confronting us right now to get a response out of us to see how we're going to respond to the corruption and the correction that needs to happen in our lives. Yes, yeah, some people have argued that coronavirus is because of our corruption and, and, and we need the corruption and correction in our life. And I do not uh, argue with all of them, but there are a whole lot of other things that are happening that we are being confronted with. We're being confronted with not just coronaviruses, uh, and pandemics and pestilences. We are being confronted with our with our own vileness in our own spirit, with the viruses of our heart, the viruses of our mind, the virus of our unfaithfulness and our unforgiveness and our lack of trust in him and hoping that he will take us to the place that we need to go. We are confronted by so many things. And yet the question is, what is our response to our reality? Yeah, brothers and sisters, we've he's seen the consultation. And we've seen the confrontation, the consultation towards our reality of the situation that we're in and the confrontation to elicit a response for the place and space that we find ourselves. But thirdly, brothers and sisters, focusing on the book helps us with our consolation. It brings consolation to our heart, even in the midst of our corruption, even in, when we're in need of correction, even when we know the content and the context of our lives has been wholly against God. We've forsaken him, and but he has forgiven us. When we have turned against him and provoked him and uh, to anger, and yet he has pardoned us, when he has done so much for us and we have done so little to him, we can still find consolation in the fact, if we respond the right way, we can find some consolation, even in the middle of our corruption, as we get ready for correction. Verse 18 through 20 tells us, but that hold of the prophetess said to the men who had come to see her, but to the king of Judah, go back and tell him, go tell good King Josiah, that young boy who is leading Israel and trying his best to make Israel uh, better than what she was, than his granddaddy had did, who sent you to inquire for me. Tell him that this is what the Lord told me to tell him concerning the words that you have heard in the book, because you focused on the book, because you looked into the book and your heart was tender and responsive, and you were humbled by what you read and what you heard and your heart and in, in your heart, and you heeded the words and you heard what I spoke against this place and against the people who inhabited that they should become a des desolation and a curse. And because you tore your clothes in humble submission to me and wept before me in my presence, I also have heard you, said the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all of the evil disaster which I'm going to bring on this place. And they brought that answer back from the king. And so, brothers and sisters, I know you're, you're asking the question, well, wait a minute. He, this woman told the king that he was going to die. This woman told the king that he was, he was going to be buried. This woman told that, that, that the disaster was still coming. Where is the consolation in that? How is that going to, how, how is that going to help me in my situation today? I, I'm trying to repent 
of the stuff that I've done in my life. I'm trying to make amends and reform myself from all of the stuff that I've done. But if you're telling me that I'm going to have to deal with the disaster in my life anyway, and I'm going to have to deal with the destruction that's coming around me anyway, notice that the text says the disaster is coming, but yet it's going to be delayed because it was coming right now. But because you humbled yourself, I'm going to bring it a little later for you. Yeah, God can say in his consolation to us that look, your because you have repented, because you have uh, in your mind had contrition and conviction, I'm still going to have to give you the consequences of your actions, but I'm going to delay them into a point where you can better deal with them down the road. That's what he says to young Josiah and young King Josiah. And uh, because consolation evidence is repentance in our life. Uh, we are consolated when we focus on the book and know that the book has called us to a place of repentance. And then when we under with contrition and conviction yield to the word of God and faithfully submit to what he has said and we tear our clothes and we weep. Uh, to God about the conditions of not only just our own life, but the condition of our community and our country, God says that kind of conviction, that kind of contrition will buy you some time. Oh, brothers and sisters, and in the consolation that of repentance that says contrition and conviction will buy you some time, it does not mean that your days will be all happy and go lucky, but it does mean that I will halt the destruction until you get to a place resting in my bosom where I can hold you, but still hold them accountable. Oh, yeah, brothers and sisters, because what's you not what we don't see in the text is, well, what what Josiah did as a response to the things that he heard in the book and how his repentance led him to in implement reforms in the city and in the country of Israel, how he tore down the statues that they had been bowing to, how he removed the places that they had been burning incense to, how he cast out all of the all of the people who were uh, reading palms and, and reading tarot cards and lighting up stuff and doing divination and all of that, all of the Josiah had done a bunch of reform in the context after he heard what was in the book. But because he was focused on the book and trying to get right with God, God said, I'm going to put your uh, consequences off just a little. He said, yeah. You're still going to have to deal with the clear consequences because I cannot go back on my word. But the consequences won't come in your lifetime. I won't allow you to see all of the evil that's coming. I won't allow you to see the destruction that's coming. I won't allow you to see the desolation that's coming. And for some of us, that's shouting good news right there, that we have an opportunity to get it right and to reform some things in our hearts and in our lives and in our families and in our homes right now that will delay some destruction that was intended to be coming in that day. Oh, yeah, brothers and sisters, I got to tell you that God wants you to know that even in judgment, it comes with some mercy. We don't get nearly everything that we deserve. And I thank God right now that I hadn't gotten everything that I deserve. I thank God that I've done a couple of things better in life than I used to do. And some of the consequences of my past behavior are delayed and put off for a put period of time down the road. I don't know about you, but that's good news right there. That's inspiring news right there. That's shouting news right there. That hallelujah good news right there. His consequences Isolation is evidenced in my repentance. And so he can bring upon my uh, conviction a place where I can celebrate even what he's doing, even when I know consequences are coming my way. Oh, brothers and sisters, contrition can delay the coming wrath, even if it doesn't delete it in your life. Brothers and sisters, I want you to get this and get this good. Josiah was told by the prophetess that he would go to his grave in peace. Now watch this. If you read the text a little further into chapter, 20, into chapter 24, you will discover that Josiah died in battle. Now that doesn't sound like peace, but watch this. For a king to die in battle was an honor. For a king to die in battle after he had reformed his country 
gave him double honor for a king to die and be honored by all of the people as a hero of the country means, means for him that Josiah's name was exalted because he had humbled himself and all of the other kings of Judah and Israel name had been put down because they had exalted themselves. Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm trying to tell you, even if you die on the battlefield, you can die in peace because your heart and, and your soul is at peace with what God has already done in your life. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on in our world. Oh, and the reality of the situation is that we've caused ourselves some trouble and we have got to respond in, with contrition and conviction to the corruption and, and, the, and the correction that's needed in our life. But when we come to God in repentance, God says, I will reform your life if you connect with my son. Oh, because you look, brothers and sisters, the battle is not over. The battle is not won for you and I individually in our time today. But guess what? Your battles have all been fought and your battles have all been won because one day, and we're getting ready to come up on Easter now, getting ready to come up on Easter because one day Jesus fought the battle for your load, for your life, and for your soul. They stretched him wide. They hung him high. They put nails in his hands and feet, rivets in his body, and he died just for you and I to fight the battle that we could not fight. Jesus paid the price for what we could not pay. And because of that, we now know that God is guarding, guiding, and governing our obedience through his word if we will just focus on the book in all of our journeys from the wilderness to the promised land. Oh yeah, brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Lord God, help us to follow after you. Help us to focus on your book. Help us to follow after godly leaders who rely only on your word, who do not run away from your word, who do not rebel against your word, who do not reject your word as given by the prophets of old and even by the prophets of, of, of our time so that we will know that there's correction in, needed in our life and that in, their consequences may be coming. We can be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb and that we can learn to operate in faith, not in fear, not in foolishness, not in futility. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, we want to offer you the opportunity to focus your life on the book. You might have been living your life your own way and in your own and in your own time frame, out of your own feelings, out of your own facts. But God says it's time for you to focus on the book and live by faith. But by faith, you can be made whole. And we want to give you that opportunity. We invite you to do that. So now contact us at any of those um, uh opportunities on down on the screen and I promise you we'll get somebody in who can counsel with you, talk with you and, 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 and take you into a place of carefrontation so that we can make sure uh, that you're ready to walk your walk with the Lord and head from your wilderness to your promised land in Jesus name. Amen. Won't you do it? Listen, brothers and sisters, thank God again for all of you all being with us. Thank God for you all watching us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and, and in our call-in line. I am so grateful and thankful to all of you who partner with us and who are praying for us and who participate with us in this ministry. Listen, we are, we are eternally grateful and we want you to continue knowing we cannot do this without you. We continue to need you to survive. We continue to ask you to be supporters and contributors of, this, of, of the uh, ministry and the service that we're doing in our church and in our community. Yeah, we're still not in the sanctuary, but we're getting closer and closer. Thank God for the vaccines. They seem to be doing a, a good work. We know that there's, there's some potential variations uh, that are coming and we're concerned about those and we're still looking for those. And we're still looking to see what's going to happen with that. And let, listen, let me just go ahead and say it. Uh, we are thinking about and praying about the possibility of a of an Easter service, but it 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 it, it right now it still does not look uh, look like we might not be able to do that in the way that God that I believe would be safe and would honor God, and it, it it 
getting into the sanctuary for Easter just to say you were in the sanctuary for Easter and, and not make sure that you're providing safety and, and security and a, and a sound uh, principle for God is not what God wants uh, us, how God wants us to celebrate Easter. God wants us to celebrate Easter knowing that he, we are resurrected Easter people and redemption is possible even if that means you don't have service on Easter Sunday morning. Oh, brothers and sisters, I continue to pray and encourage you to wear your masks, wash your hands, and make sure you watch your distance, watch your back, and watch out for your neighbor. Now, brothers and sisters, let's hear the benediction for the day. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace and give you peace. Now let the whole church say, amen. Brothers and sisters, if it's God's will, we'll see you next time.